Hello and welcome to Stellar Evolution Part 1, The Birth, Life, and Death of a Sun-like Star. Lecture 4 in my six-part lecture series, Cosmology, the Study of the Universe. My name is Fulvia Fiorani. With this lecture, we start our two-part lecture series on stellar evolution. You might wonder why we talk about stellar evolution in the context of the universe as a whole. Well, just like galaxies are the building blocks of the large-scale structure of the universe, stars are the building blocks of galaxies. But more importantly, cosmology must also consider what the universe and everything within it is made of. So within that context, we ask ourselves, where do the heavier elements beyond hydrogen and helium that were produced shortly after the Big Bang that make up future generations of stars, planetary systems, our own planet Earth, and indeed humans, come from? The answer is in the stars. In today's lecture, we will talk about the birth of stars in general, how they live their lives by fusing lighter elements into heavier ones, and finally, we will see the death process of a sun-like star. So what specifically will we cover today? Well, we start by answering the questions, what is a star? Then we'll briefly talk about the stellar life cycle from birth to death. We will see how and where stars are born and see some beautiful images from the Hubble Space Telescope. Then we'll spend some time on our own sun as an example of an average midlife star and start to see the process by which stars fuse lighter elements into heavier elements in their cores. We will then see how our sun and similar stars will die, producing beautiful planetary nebula and eventually ending as a white dwarf. Since the dawn of prehistoric time, humans have looked up at the beauty of the night sky. Some would make up stories about the patterns they saw. For example, here is Orion, the great hunter, accompanied by his two canine companions, Canis Major and Canis Minor. And they are hunting the bull Taurus and being watched by the twins Castor and Pollux. But beside the fancy patterns and stories, when we look into the night sky with the naked eye, the stars pretty much look all alike. Of course, some are brighter than others, some are tiny, and some seem to be larger. But we really can't get a feel for their actual physical characteristics by simply looking at them with the naked eye. So let's take a look at the heart of our Milky Way galaxy as seen by the Hubble Space Telescope. We can easily find the heart of the Milky Way by finding the teapot asterism in the constellation Sagittarius. Above the spout is the actual center of our galaxy. We will see what's going on at the center of our galaxy in our next lecture. Today we will look at this bright area next to the center. What Hubble sees is this magnificent star field. It looks like a sparkling jewel box in the sky. Now this image clearly shows us that stars come in a variety of colors and brightness. So what does that tell us about the stars? Well, a star's color reveals its surface temperature. Knowing a star's surface temperature and its luminosity tells us a lot about a star. For example, it allows astronomers and physicists to calculate a star's mass, its most important characteristic, its age, and its size. Most blue stars are very young and hot, up to 10 times hotter than our sun. They consume their fuel very quickly and therefore live short lives. Red stars come in two types, red dwarfs and red giants. Red dwarf stars have a temperature of about half of our sun. They consume their fuel very slowly and therefore live very long lives. The red giant stars are stars approaching the end of their lives. Some of them will die quietly as a white dwarf, while others will die violently in an explosion known as a supernova. Our sun is a yellow star. In about five billion years, it will evolve into a red giant, then quietly fade away as a planetary nebula and a white dwarf. So what is a star? Well, a star is a massive, self-luminous ball of hot gas that is held together by gravity and releasing energy into space 
in the form of radiation. Now, if in real estate the three key words are location, 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 for stars, the three key words are gravity, gravity, and gravity. We will see that it is by gravity that a star is born. During their lifetime, they are continually struggling against gravity, and gravity is finally responsible for their death. Now, we mentioned that a star releases energy into space in the form of radiation. But where does the energy come from? Well, a star is basically a giant nuclear fusion reactor. We will see that the core of a star fuses lighter elements into heavier ones, and in the process, a large amount of energy is released. So stars shine because their furnaces at their centers make their surfaces very hot, and therefore they glow. The nuclear reactions in the core are controlled. In other words, they are non-explosive. They occur at exactly the rate necessary to keep a star in a stable form. So the energy released from the core is just sufficient to counteract the gravitational collapse. The process by which stars fuse lighter elements into heavier ones in their cores is called st stellar nucleosynthesis. Almost all naturally occurring elements, those heavier than helium, are made during a star's lifetime. As we saw in our previous lecture, all of the hydrogen and most of the helium in the universe were produced within the first few minutes after the Big Bang. Carbon is the most fundamental element in all of life. Every living cell, every organic compound, contains carbon as its building block. But where does all the carbon come from? Well, the answer is it is produced by fusion process within the core of stars. And how about oxygen? It is what we breathe. It is in every drop of water. That, too, is produced in the core of stars. We will see that up to carbon and some oxygen can be produced in sun-like stars. But for the heavier elements, we need more massive stars. Silicon is the central element for today's technological world. And yes, all the atoms of silicon were produced in the core of stars. Other familiar elements, such as sodium, calcium, and titanium, all made in stars. Even iron, the main element in our Earth's core and a key part of our red blood cells, every atom of iron was made in the core of a star. Now, iron is a very special element in stellar nucleosynthesis because it is the heaviest element that can be produced in the core of a star. So what about the heavier elements, such as gold, uranium, and silver? We will see in our next lecture that when very massive stars die, they explode in what is known as a supernova. And in the process, not only do they disperse the elements within them into the universe, but the explosion releases so much energy that the heavier elements are produced in the process. All stars have a life cycle. They are born, they live a stable life for a while, and they eventually die. As already mentioned, some stars live longer than others. So what is the lifespan of a star? Well, stars can live anywhere from a few million years to several billion years. And obviously, we cannot study the life of a single star from its beginning to its end. But what we can do is study many stars at various stages of their lives and put together an overall picture of stellar evolution. As we will see, stars are born in giant clouds of interstellar gas and dust. They spend 90% of their lives in a very stable phase called the main sequence. Our sun is about 5 billion years old and is in the middle of this phase. Once stars have used up their internal fuel, they begin to die. The way they die depends on their initial or their birth mass. Some, some will die quietly as a planetary nebula and eventually a white dwarf, and others will die violently as a supernova, leaving behind mysterious objects such as neutron stars and black holes. Let's briefly look at this life cycle. 
All stars start out as a gravitationally collapsing cloud of interstellar gas and dust, mostly hydrogen and helium, with small percentage of heavier elements. The type of stars they become depends on the initial mass. In this lecture, we will cover an average sun-like star. These are stars with up to eight solar masses. When these stars run out of their initial fuel, they become red giants. After the red giant phase, they produce a beautiful planetary nebula and finally end up as a white dwarf and quietly fade away. In the next lecture, we will see what happens to more massive stars, those greater than 10 solar masses. They are born in the same way from a gravitationally collapsing cloud of gas and dust. And as they run out of their fuel, they become red giants. And here is where they mainly differ from smaller stars. At the end of the red giant phase, they violently explode in a supernova, the remnants of which are either a neutron star or a black hole. We now start to look at these various phases in more detail. And we start with where and how stars are born. Stars are born in immense clouds of interstellar gas and dust called nebulae. That's from the Latin word for cloud. This is a beautiful example called the Carina Nebula. As you can see, some regions are denser than others. The darker areas indicate the denser regions of gas and dust. Gravity goes to work within the cloud, bringing together material within the slightly denser regions of the cloud. And through gravity's relentless inward pull on the surrounding material, denser regions become denser and denser. And as the material crushes inward, it gets hotter and hotter. Now, before a star is fully born, it goes through a phase called a protostar. At this point, we have a dense core, but it is still gravitationally gathering material while getting hotter and hotter until the core is hot enough to start fusing hydrogen into helium. And it is at this point that a star is born. The nuclear fusion in the core now generates enough outward pressure and heat to push against gravity. This lifelong struggle between the inward gravitational collapse and the outward push from radiation pressure is what defines the various stages in the life of a star. We start our look at these beautiful star-forming regions with the Orion Nebula. This is the closest star-forming region to Earth and it is found in the sword of Orion. It is actually visible to the naked eye, but of course not with these beautiful colors. As already mentioned, these nebulae are giant clouds of interstellar gas and dust. Most of the gas is hydrogen, while the dust is traces of other elements formed by previous generations of stars and dispersed throughout space as they die. Through the action of gravity, Portions of these clouds collapse inward, getting denser and denser and hotter and hotter until hydrogen starts fusing into helium and a star is born. The dark areas indicate very dense areas of gas and dust. You can envision these areas collapsing in on themselves under the effect of gravity and forming new stars. The beautiful colors we see are from ionized gases. The high-energy ultraviolet radiation from young hot stars ionizes the surrounding gases, giving these beautiful glowing colors. Because these regions are where stars are born, they are often referred to as stellar nurseries. The Orion Nebula is part of the greater Orion Molecular Cloud. Also part of the Orion Molecular Cloud is the famous Horsehead Nebula. The Horsehead Nebula is what is called a pillar of gas and dust. Now, this image is captured in the near infrared. And this is a close up as seen both in the visible and infrared spectrum. Since much of the visible light is blocked by the gas and dust, the nebula appears like a dark cloud in the visible spectrum. But infrared light can pass through the dense gas and dust and allows us to see much more detail. We can clearly see that by studying stellar nurseries in different wavelengths of light, we can learn about different aspects of the nurseries. 
We'll see more examples as we go along. Another animal-like formation is found in the Trifid Nebula. This looks like a snail's head. And the eye stalks are very interesting. One of them is a regular pillar of gas and dust, while the other is half of a bipolar jet from a protostar. Now, as material falls inward toward the core of a rotating protostar, some of the material gets ejected out along the axis of rotation, forming jets. This is a beautiful ground-based image of the Eagle Nebula. As you can see, there are many pillars and dense areas. And Hubble has zoomed in on two areas in particular. The first one is this lovely stellar pillar, and the second one is one of Hubble's most famous images. So let's take a closer look. The first one appears like a winged fairy tale like creature, and the second is the famously named Pillars of Creation. These giant pillars of gas and dust are incubators for embryonic stars. You can see how dense these pillars are, and areas within these pillars will collapse to form new stars. The tips of the columns are illuminated by ultraviolet light from hot, massive newborn stars. Now, when I say giant, it doesn't quite give a real sense of their actual size. The tallest column in the Pillars of Creation image is four light years tall. That's 24 trillion miles. And the delicate looking fairy tale like creature is 9.5 light years high. That's 57 trillion miles, more than twice the distance to our sun's nearest star. Here is the 25th anniversary release of Pillars, taken with Hubble's updated camera. And they also released it in the infrared, showing us much more detail, but perhaps not as beautiful as in the visible. This is a beautiful image of the star-forming region in the Laguna Nebula. And here is a closer look at the somewhat eerie-looking central structures of gas and dust. This small portion of the Carina Nebula seems like a beautiful painted landscape. This is a magnificent panoramic view of the central region of the Carina Nebula. Now, Hubble has zoomed in on many areas, but we will take a look at two of them. The first one right here, and the second one is a particularly beautiful one. The first one shows us some beautiful gas and dust pillars that look like cosmic ice structures. And the second one is very appropriately called Mystic Mountain. At the tip of the mountain, we can see the markers for the birth of a new star. These are two bipolar protostellar jets that we mentioned earlier as one of the eye stalks of the Trifid Nebula. And here is a closer view. Now, once again, these jets form as material falls inward toward the center of a newly forming star. Now, most of the material falls onto the core, but some of it gets ejected out along the axis of rotation, forming these bipolar jets. And here are two other examples of protostellar jets as they punch through the enshrouding cloud of gas and dust. Now, this is a beautiful view of a less studied stellar region in the Orion molecular cloud complex sometimes referred to as Orion's little brother. In it, we see several brilliant young stars still cocooned by interstellar gas and dust. Now, once a star is born, its stellar wind starts to push out on the enshrouding cocoon of gas and dust. These are two examples of such a process. And over time, the stars will clear their surroundings. Another beautiful example of new young hot stars sculpting the surrounding cloud of gas and dust. This is a very small region of a much larger nebula called the War and Peace Nebula. Because in the infrared spectrum, one area resembles a dove and in another a skull. But what I see in this, when rotated by 90 degrees, is a beautiful cosmic nativity scene. 
Now, stars are usually born in clusters. This image from the outer edge of the small Magellanic Cloud shows bright blue newly formed stars that are blowing out a cavity in the center of this region known as N90. Because this area is located far from the center of the small Magellanic Cloud, we can also see numerous background galaxies, giving these stellar newcomers a beautiful background from which to be observed. This star-forming region contains one of the most impressive massive young star clusters in the Milky Way. This formation is thought to have occurred around one million years ago. The hot blue stars at the core are carving out a huge cavity within the nebula. Now besides their beauty, what information can we get from these clusters? Well, most of the stars in a cluster are born at the same time but they differ in mass, size, temperature, and color. Now, as mentioned before, the course of a star's life is determined by its birth mass. Since a cluster contains stars that were all born at the same time, but with different masses, when we observe them, they will be at different stages of their lives. So, studying stellar clusters gives us an opportunity for detailed analysis of the stellar life cycles. Now, keeping this in mind, let's enjoy some more images of these beautiful star-forming regions. This is a more expansive view of the previous cluster. It is dubbed fireworks because the young, bright collection of stars looks like an aerial burst. We can clearly see that the ultraviolet radiation and the violent stellar winds have blown out an enormous cavity in the gas and dust enveloping the cluster and it provides an unobstructed view of the cluster. This is the most detailed view of the Tarantula Nebula in the Large Magellanic Cloud. It is the brightest and largest star-forming region in our galactic neighborhood. At the center of the Tarantula Nebula is the young and dense star cluster R136. This cluster contains thousands of young hot blue stars and are among the most massive and luminous stars known. Several of them are over 100 times more massive than our Sun. Another beautiful star-forming region in the Large Magellanic Cloud is called LH95. The interesting aspect of this region is that it reveals an area where both low-mass infant stars and their much more massive stellar neighbors reside. Studying star formation regions within the Large Magellanic Clouds gives astronomers an insight into star forming regions outside of our own Milky Way galaxy and shows that the initial star mass distribution of newly forming stars in other galaxies does not seem to differ from that of our own Milky Way galaxy. Now, coming back to our galaxy, this is Hubble's 25th anniversary image of the magnificent Westerlin II cluster. This is a giant sparkling cluster of about 3,000 stars. The estimated age of the cluster is about 2 million years old and contains some of the hottest, brightest, and most massive stars known. We can clearly see how the radiation and stellar winds have sculpted a cavity in the surrounding gas and dust. And over time, radiation from the cluster will disperse the molecular cloud. Let's take a look at the central region of Westerlin II. This is the beautiful image of the central region of the giant stellar nursery called the sparkling centerpiece of Westerlin II. Now the brilliant blue stars seen throughout the image are mostly just foreground stars. Now we end this section of stellar nurseries and young star clusters with this beautiful view of a stellar association within the Carina Nebula. This image was taken in the infrared by ESO's Very Large Telescope, revealing many hidden secrets within the Carina Nebula. In particular, we'll focus on this cluster. This is the beautiful open star cluster Trumpler 14. It is one of the youngest star clusters and contains 2,000 stars. Because it is so young, it has one of the highest concentrations of massive luminous stars in the entire Milky Way. 
because they are so massive, these blue-white stars are burning their hydrogen very quickly and will end their lives in just a few million years in giant supernova explosions, dispersing all the elements within their cores into the surrounding environment. The combination of the supernova shock waves and the outgoing flow of elements will kickstart the beginning of a new generation of metal-rich stars, together with their planetary systems, in an ongoing cycle of star birth and death. So the death of a star gives rise to the birth of next generation stars. We've talked a lot about the birth of stars, but what about their planetary systems? Within the Orion Nebula, Hubble has been able to capture some planetary systems in formation. These are called protoplanetary disks, or proplids for short. And here we see six of the 42 discovered in the Orion Nebula. Here's a bit of a larger view of each proplid. Now these are very difficult to image because they're still shrouded by much of the molecular cloud from which they form. And although these images are a bit grainy, we can clearly see the newly forming stars within the disk of material around them. It is from this disk of material that planets will form. As an example of planetary system formation, let's look at the formation of our own solar system. Our solar system formed 4.6 billion years ago. As all stars, our own sun was formed by a gravitationally collapsing cloud of gas and dust. The initial collapse can be triggered by gravity alone or can be triggered by a supernova shockwave. Now as gravity pulls material towards the center, the material starts to rotate, at first slowly, then as the cloud continues to collapse, it rotates faster and faster. In physics terms, this is called the law of conservation of angular momentum. But the best way to understand this is the example of an ice skater. The ice skater starts a spin slowly with his or her arms stretched out. And as the arms are brought in close to the body, the spin gets faster and faster. Now spinning objects tend to get flung out away from the, their axis of rotation, just like the skirt or loose clothes on the ice skater. So as the cloud continues to collapse, it's spinning faster and faster, and some of the material is being flung out and flattening into a disk. Most of the material, mostly hydrogen, collapses towards the center, forming the protosun, which continues to increase in pressure and temperature. In the meantime, the material in the disk coalesces and clumps together to form planetesimal, protoplanets, and eventually planets. Now when the mass, temperature, and pressure in the protosun is high enough to ignite nuclear fusion, the sun is born. The resulting blast of solar wind and radiation sweeps through the newly formed system, clearing out most of the remaining dust and what remains is a fully formed solar system, with all the planets revolving in the same direction and approximately on the same plane around the central sun. So now we've seen where and how stars are born. Let's look at what stars do during their midlife. During their midlife, stars are at their most stable, secure, and productive stages of their lives. As we've seen, what signals the birth of a star is the ignition of nuclear fusion in its core. And here we see the hot core of hydrogen fusing into helium and surrounding a shell of hydrogen. Nuclear fusion is the most important thing that stars do in this stage. It is the basic force that drives stars to do what they do. In other words, it, it is what drives their life's work of producing heavier elements by fusing lighter elements into heavier ones. During this stage, the outward radiation pressure of nuclear fusion balances the inward pull of gravity. This is a very stable phase, and stars will remain in this stage as long as they have hydrogen in their cores. So a star's life is really a struggle to survive against the relentless crush of gravity. At this stage, stars do the only thing they really can do to survive, and that is to push back. 
So all stars are born in the same way. The process starts with a collapse under gravity within a giant cloud of gas and dust until it ignites as a fully fledged star. But we also know that during their lives, stars differ from one another in their physical properties, temperature, color, luminosity. So what determines the characteristics of stars during their lifetime? Well, the answer is mass. Mass is the most important property of a star. A star's mass determines all of its other characteristics, such as temperature, color, size, and luminosity. It determines how long the star will live, and it determines the matter in which it will eventually die. Stars that are in their midlife and most stable stage of their lives are called main sequence stars. Let's take a look at the most fundamental astrophysical tool for understanding the property of stars. This is known as the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or simply the HR diagram. It interprets how stars evolve during their lives. So the HR diagram is a graph of stellar luminosity on the vertical axis and surface temperature on the horizontal axis. The letters represent the spectral type, with O stars being the hottest and M stars the coolest. Recall these are the OB a fine girl kiss me stellar classifications which we saw in our first lecture. What is amazing about this diagram is that stars are not scattered randomly, but they fall into groups. About 90% of all stars fall into this diagonal band across the diagram called the main sequence. This tells us that stars can only have particular combinations of temperature and luminosity. The hottest O-type stars are extremely luminous, and the coolest M-type stars are extremely dim. When the information about a star's mass is added, there is a clear correlation. The hottest, most luminous stars are also the most massive, while the least luminous are also the least massive. In other words, the main sequence of the HR diagram reveals that what fundamentally drives the physical property of stars is mass. So 90% of all stars are part of the main sequence. But what about the others? We see that some appear in the upper right of the diagram and some in the lower left. So what does the HR diagram tell us about these stars? In the upper right corner, we see stars that have low temperature, but yet are very luminous. Therefore, they must be very large. These stars are called red giants and red supergiants. In the lower left, we see stars that are very hot, yet very dim. Therefore, they must be very small. These stars are called white dwarfs. The red giants and supergiants are stars that have begun their death process while the white dwarfs are dead stars. In other words, they are stellar corpses. Our sun is a G2 type main sequence star with a surface temperature of about 6,000 Kelvin. So the HR diagram also gives us information about stellar life cycle. What we can infer is that stars spend most of their lives in a happy, stable configuration as main sequence stars and end their lives relatively fast. We will talk about red giants and white dwarfs in this lecture, and we will leave red supergiants for the next. So all stars start their lives somewhere on the main sequence, precisely where is determined by their birth mass. They will stay on the main sequence for about 90% of their lives until they begin to die. So let's see some of the main sequence stellar properties. The first is size. Once we know the temperature and luminosity of a star, we can plug them into this equation and simply calculate the star's radius. A star's luminosity is approximately proportional to the cube of its mass. So the more massive a star, the much more luminous it is. A star's lifetime is approximately inversely proportional to the square of its mass. So the more massive a star, the shorter its lifetime. 
let's look at a couple of examples. Our reference is the sun with a solar mass of 1, and a solar luminosity of 1, and a lifetime of 10 billion years. A star that is 10 times more massive than the sun will have a luminosity that is 4,500 times the luminosity of the sun. An example of such a star is Spica, as seen here on the top of the main sequence. Now, a star that is one-tenth the mass of the sun will have a luminosity that is only one one-thousandth that of our sun. An example of such a star is Proxima Centauri, as seen here on the bottom of the main sequence. Now let's look at the lifetime. Spica, the tenth solar mass star, will live only 32 million years compared to 10 billion years for our sun. And tiny Proxima Centauri will live 3 trillion years. This is more than the current age of the universe. Now let's take a brief look at the stellar life cycle on the HR diagram. We will later go into more detail. We start with our sun. At the end of its main sequence phase, or when all the hydrogen has fused into helium in its core, the sun will expand and cool into a red giant. It will briefly increase its surface temperature, then cool down again until finally all the nuclear fusion has ended in the core. At that point, what will be left of the sun is a white dwarf. Now let's look at a more massive star. As its main sequence phase ends, it will become a red supergiant. It will go through a few phases of heating and cooling, and eventually, when all the nuclear fusion has ended, it will explode and disappear off the HR diagram. We will go into much more greater, greater detail about the more massive supergiants and their eventual explosion in the next lecture. For now, let's take a look at our sun as an example of an average midlife star. The sun, as all stars, is a nearly perfect sphere made entirely of gas. Essentially, it is a ball of hot, extremely dense gas. The visible surface is called the photosphere, and it is what we see shining in the sky. This is an actual filtered image of the sun taken by the Solar Dynamic Observatory. The surface temperature is about 6,000 degrees Celsius, or 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and this is hot enough to melt any solid. The sun's density increases steadily as you go towards the center. A gas can be at great density and still remain a gas, as long as the temperature is high enough. The sun's core is denser than solid lead, yet it is a gas. The temperature in the core is 50, 15 million degrees Celsius, or about 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. And at that temperature, nuclear fusion of hydrogen to helium in the core is the most important thing the sun does at this stage. But before we get to that, let's look at some basic solar data. The sun is about 4.6 billion years old and has another 5 billion years to go. The diameter of the sun is 100 times the diameter of Earth, and its mass is over 300,000 times that of the Earth. By volume, you can fit 1 million Earths into the sun. The sun, of course, is the largest body in our solar system and accounts for 99.8% of all the mass in the solar system. And finally, the sun provides for practically all the energy required to live on Earth. So how does the sun and all stars generate all this energy? Well, the answer, of course, is nuclear fusion. Now, we've mentioned nuclear fusion quite a few times already, but what exactly is it? And how does it generate so much energy? Well, nuclear fusion is the fusing together of lighter elements into heavier ones. For example, the fusing of hydrogen into helium. And in this process, a very large amount of energy is released. So let's take a look at how the sun actually does this. This is the proton-proton chain reaction that occurs in the core of the sun. But you will be happy to know that we will not go over 
all of these details. But what we will see is nuclear fusion in a nutshell. First of all, 75% of the sun is made of hydrogen. So we will start with four hydrogen nuclei, or simply four protons. Under the extreme high temperature and pressure in the sun's core, the four protons fuse together to form one helium nucleus, which is made of two protons and two neutrons. And in this process, a huge amount of energy is released. But we still haven't answered the question of where this energy comes from. Well, it turns out that the mass of the helium nucleus is a little less than the mass of the original four hydrogen nuclei. And this means that in the fusion process, a small amount of mass is lost. Now here is the beauty. That little bit of lost mass is converted into energy using E equals mc squared, probably the most famous equation in physics and one of the most beautiful expressions in all of science. Now, I'm sure that most, if not all of you, have seen this equation before. But maybe some of you might not have a true appreciation for what it means. So let's get to know it. What the equation means in words is that energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. Now c squared is simply a conversion factor, so let's put that aside for a moment. In essence, what this equation tells us is that mass and energy are equivalent. They are interchangeable. In other words, anything that has mass has an equivalent amount of energy and vice versa. Now let's look at the conversion factor, c squared. c, of course, is the speed of light. Its value is 300 million meters per second. Now if you square 300 million, you get 90,000 trillion. That's a pretty big number. So that means that even a small amount of mass is equivalent to a huge amount of energy. So let's see an actual example. Every second, the sun converts about 600 million tons of hydrogen into 596 million tons of helium. That means that 4 million tons of mass is lost in the process. Now we plug 4 million tons into E equals mc squared, and what we get is 400 trillion trillion watts. That's 4 times 10 to the 26. Now we all know that's a big number, but we really do not have an intuition for it. So in practical terms, this means that every second the sun puts out what 3 billion of our most powerful power plants would put out in a year. Now as a reference, we currently have about 8,000 power plants in the U.S. And once again, every second the sun puts out what 3 billion of our most powerful power plants would put out in a year. That is absolutely amazing. But what's even more amazing is that the sun will continue to put out that amount of energy every second for the next five billion years. But alas, the sun, as all the other stars, will eventually run out of fuel. And when that happens, they will begin the final stages of their lives. As previously mentioned, the manner in which a star will die depends on its initial or its birth mass. Stars with a birth mass of up to eight solar masses, this includes our sun, will die quietly as a planetary nebula and eventually fade away as a white dwarf. Stars that are born with a mass greater than 10 solar masses will die in a violent explosion called a supernova, leaving behind either a neutron star or a black hole. In this lecture, we will talk about the first group of lower mass stars, and in the next lecture, we will cover the second group of more massive stars. We start by seeing how a star transitions from its midlife phase and moves towards its final stages. Recall that during a li star's lifetime, it is constantly fighting against the relentless pull of gravity, and the only thing a star can do to survive is to push back. So the inward gravitational collapse 
is balanced by the outward pressure and heat generated by nuclear fusion reactions in the core. And as we know, stars in their midlife phase are called main sequence stars. This is the most stable phase in a star's life. They are happily fusing their abundance of hydrogen into helium. And here we see our main sequence star fusing hydrogen into helium in its core, which is surrounded by a shell of cooler hydrogen. Eventually, however, the hydrogen in the core will run out. In other words, all of the hydrogen in the core will eventually fuse into helium. So once the hydrogen runs out, there will be no more nuclear reactions in the core. This means that there will be no more outward pressure. So what happens? Well, gravity takes over. So now the star will start to gravitationally collapse again. As it collapses, the temperature in the core increases until it is hot enough to start a new nuclear fusion reaction fusing helium into carbon. When this happens, the star temporarily restabilizes as the inward gravitational collapse is balanced by the outward pressure generated by the new nuclear fusion process. So here we see the star's core fusing helium into carbon. The hot core is surrounded by a shell of hydrogen fusing into helium. And then we have the outer shell of hydrogen. The heat from the core and the shell of fusing hydrogen push the cooler hydrogen shell outward, greatly expanding the size of the star. Now as gas expands, it cools and shifts toward the red. So our expanded star becomes what is known as a red giant. During this phase, our sun will expand out to the orbit of Mercury. Eventually, all of the helium will also run out. And when that happens, once again, there will be no longer be nuclear fusion reactions in the core, so the struggle continues. And with no more outward pressure, it's the same story. Gravity takes over. And just as before, the inward gravitational collapse will increase the temperature of the core. But this time, there isn't enough mass to increase the temperature to start a new nuclear reaction. So there are no more nuclear reactions in the core. So what we have is an extremely hot and dense carbon core. The hot core is surrounded by fusing shells of helium into carbon and hydrogen into helium, pushing the outer shell even farther out. This is the second red giant phase, and our sun will likely expand out to the orbit of Earth. As the outer shell of hydrogen gas continues to expand, it becomes very loosely bound to the rest of the dying star. So as the gases continue to expand outward, we are left with the beautiful planetary nebula. Now before we talk about these beautiful objects, their name can be a bit confusing and deserves an explanation. When these objects were first observed with the early telescopes of the late 1700s, they appeared to have round, planet-like shapes. So they were classified as planetary nebulae, and the name stuck, even though we know today that they are unrelated to planets or exoplanets. So a planetary nebula is a bubble of expanding gas surrounding a dead star. Stars can shed up more than half of their mass to the planetary nebula. As the planetary nebula expands, it disperses carbon into the surrounding space. Recall that carbon is the key element for all known life on Earth. This is where most of the carbon comes from. What is left of the star is a very small and extremely hot, dense core called a white dwarf. The core is so hot that it emits ultraviolet radiation ionizing the surrounding gases and causing them to glow. The size of a typical planetary nebula is about one light year across, and within about 10,000 years from its formation, the expanding gases fu will fully dissipate and are incorporated into the surrounding medium, leaving behind the white dwarf. Now before we see some beautiful images of planetary nebula, let's take a brief look at the stellar corpse known as a white dwarf. Now here is our previous planetary nebula. 
In the center, we see what is left of the once vibrant star, a very small and extremely hot, dense, and inert core. Inert because there are no more nuclear reactions. Recall that the remaining core is made of carbon. And under the very high pressure and density in the core, the carbon can crystallize into what is commonly known as a diamond. This is an artist's illustration of the cosmic diamond Lucy. If this does in fact exist out there, it would be 10 billion trillion trillion carat. Now as mentioned at this point, there are no more nuclear reactions in the core, which is being held up against gravity by what is called electron degeneracy pressure. Essentially, the electrons are squeezed in as close as possible while still maintaining an atomic structure. So at this point, the star is officially dead. And the white dwarf will simply slowly fade away as it radiates its remaining heat energy. And this will be the ultimate fate of our sun. Now I've mentioned a few times that these white dwarfs are extremely dense. So how dense are we talking about? Well, our sun will shed about half of its mass to its planetary nebula. The remaining half will contract into a white dwarf about the size of Earth. Now remember the sun is 300,000 times the mass of the Earth. So that means that 150,000 times the mass of the Earth gets squeezed into an object the size of Earth. OK, so how dense is a white dwarf? Well, if we could scoop up one teaspoon of white dwarf, on Earth that would weigh five tons. Just one teaspoon of white dwarf. Now, as we end this lecture, let's simply enjoy some magnificent images of planetary nebula as seen by the Hubble Space Telescope. You will notice that planetary nebula are all very different, but they all have a white dwarf in their center. Many planetary nebula have been given nicknames for obvious reasons. The Cat's Eye Nebula is one of the most famous and well-studied objects. It was the first planetary nebula whose spectrum was investigated in the late 1700s, showing that planetary nebula were gaseous and not stellar in nature. This is the Eskimo Nebula, also known as the Clown Face Nebula. It resembles a person's head surrounded by a parka hood. Now once again, notice that although these are two very different looking planetary nebula, they both have a white dwarf in their centers. Now although in today's telescopes the Saturn Nebula does not look like Saturn, when it was first discovered by Herschel in 1872, it appeared like an edge on view of Saturn. These are other two examples of beautiful planetary nebula, showing the expanding bubble of ionized gases surrounding the central white dwarf. And here is the beautiful ring nebula. The different colors indicate the different gases that are dispersing into the surrounding environment. And we also have the very interesting spirograph nebula, which derives its name from the very intricate pattern. In both of these nebulas, the stellar corpses of the original star can clearly be seen. The Incubus Nebula looks more like a deep sea jellyfish than an outer space object. And the Retina Nebula, nebula is seen from its side as viewed from Earth. The next three slides are examples of bipolar nebulae. These nebulae are characterized by two lobes on either side of the star. About 25% of all planetary nebulae are bipolar nebulae. Now for reasons that are not completely understood, these dying stars eject their outer layers in a bipolar fashion. This is the magnificent butterfly nebula, imaged with two different filters. And here are two other very interesting examples of bipolar planetary nebulae. This is nicknamed the blue planetary for its obvious color, or also called the southerner because it is the brightest planetary nebula in the southern hemisphere. Now what is obvious from all of these images is that the final evolutionary stage of a sun-like star is much more complicated than just blowing out 
the outer envelope of gas. There is still a lot of astrophysics to be discovered behind these beautiful images. Now, what about our sun's future? We know that in about five billion years, our sun will evolve into a white dwarf and shed away its outer layers of gas as a planetary nebula. What we don't know is what that planetary nebula will look like, but we can rest assured that it will be beautiful. In the next lecture, we will see the fate of more massive stars. We will see how these massive stars produce elements up to iron in their cores, then die a very violent death in a giant explosion known as a supernova. During this explosion, all the elements produced within their cores and the elements beyond iron produced during the explosion itself are dispersed into the surrounding environment, seeding the universe with the elements that form future stars, planetary systems, and indeed all the elements required for life on Earth. The stellar corpses left over from these giant explosions are neutron stars, pulsars, and of course black holes, which are ultimately the focus of this lecture. I hope you've enjoyed today's lecture on the birth, life, and death of a sun-like star. Hope to see you next time, and thank you for watching.